We're going to turn together, please, to the book of Romans in chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And uh, we're going to read through a few verses together, please. From verse 33, Romans chapter 11, verse 33. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall not be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Amen, and God will bless the reading of his infallible word. Let's unite in prayer together. Our gracious Father, we come before thy throne of grace in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to thank you, Lord, for your great grace and love and mercy and kindness to us that we have been reminded of already in song and prayer, that, Lord, thou hast been good to us. The lines have fallen to us in pleasant places, and we have a goodly heritage. And we come to thee, Lord, and we ask for the help and the aid of God the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would draw near to us by your Spirit, and that we would know that help that comes from another country. Lord, that country which is above, we pray that thou would grant the anointing and enabling of God the Holy Spirit. Afresh, Lord, I give myself unreservedly to thee. I claim your cleansing and sanctifying power on my spirit, soul, and body. And for the glory of the Lord Jesus, for the extension of your kingdom, and the fulfillment of divine promises, Lord, again I take that promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take and I thank you that he, the Holy Spirit, will undertake. And I pray, Lord, that you would put a wall of fire around about us this day. And Lord, I pray that thou wouldst grant to us a consciousness of thy presence and that Jesus would be in the midst. We bow, we worship thee, and we pray for help. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, Liberated for Growth liberated for growth. Um, whenever a person comes to the Lord, they're often hindered by a whole variety of things. Uh, I was up recently in the Isle of Lewis, and there's a castle um, in the islands, and it's called Avensuya Castle. Now, it's very well known to people who are very much into sports, like uh, shooting deer and, and fishing and so on, but there's a, there's a wonderful area at the castle where there's a great um, flow of water, and the salmon come to that area, and they come to spawn and so on, and it's very interesting to watch them, uh, because sometimes there are dead fish uh, that just come down the river, just come down the stream, and they bump off uh, the different stones, and they just go out to sea. And it's a very typical picture, if you can carry it. I was meditating upon it, how that, it, you know, the, the ungodly of this world, the Bible says that, that in Ephesians 2, 
that they are controlled and manipulated by the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And every unsaved person is being carried. They're dead in trespasses and sins, so there's no resistance in them against the world. They just go with the world. They can't do anything else because they have no strength to do anything else, so they go with the world. But then you find that there are salmon that come to this uh, like strong stream, as it were. And, and you can see them, some of them are at the bottom and desiring to get up, but they, they just wait at the bottom. They don't seem to have the ability to, to just get up there for whatever reason, but they just hang about at the bottom. And then there are others, and they're extremely uh, vigilant, extremely desirous to get, uh, obviously, reproducing, and they, and they fight the current and they jump up, and they're quite, it's quite interesting and really, really uh, uh, powerful to watch them jumping as they travel up to get upstream to spawn. And they're not unlike the Christian life, because so many people, when they come to the Lord, they're a bit like the, the salmon at the bottom. They, they have life. They're not going out to sea. They're not dead. But they just don't have the ability to, to get upstream they don't have that strength that's necessary for reproduction because one of the signs of life is the desire to reproduce. And uh, often you find people who profess to be saved have very little interest or desire practically in winning the lost. There's no real desire to reproduce. And that's always a sign of sickness. It's a sign of illness spiritually. But then, as I said, there are salmon and they they jump, and they, they have a power that is stronger than the power of the water, uh, and they, they can withstand and overcome. And so I just want to speak for a little time about being liberated by the Lord for growth. Now, what hinders the Christian from being strong? What hinders the Christian from growth? And I have to clarify what I mean by growth because there is a, a, an, an element of delusion that rests on the evangelical church, and it's, it's right across the board. Uh, it's to do with our thinking as Christians, that we believe that if we go to a good evangelical church um, and we listen to the Word of God being expounded, that we are growing. But that doesn't actually work you see, it's like, it's like eating all the time. If I eat all the time, but my body didn't digest the food, then what would, would happen was it would kill me. I, I would rot inside because I have to assimilate and break down the food in my stomach in order for it to be any good to me. And what many Christians do is they just keep eating and eating and eating but they're not working it out. They're not breaking it down. They're not obeying it. They're not implementing it into their life. And so it kills them. They are actually unproductive people because the Word of God, they have been deluded into thinking, if I listen to the truth, if I go to an evangelical church, I am growing. I am going forward. But you, you may not be growing. You may just be purely intellectually more informed. It's just that your mind is more informed. You know more, but you don't know God. You don't know God any better. You don't know God's ways. You don't know him in an intimate way. And so that's a big delusion that, that lies right across the evangelical church. And sadly, many clergy and ministers, um, instead of trying to uh, you know, deal with it and, and approach it and say, listen, we're not, we're not obeying the light we have. They just keep pumping out more and more truth, uh, hoping and assuming that that will be the solution. And of course, it never has been and never, ever will be. So what hinders growth, true spiritual growth? Well, there are three things that I want to mention very briefly. The first one is sin. Sin in our lives always prevents growth, whatever that may be. Now, sometimes people, instead of acknowledging that sin is there, maybe it's a, 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 a lustful um, a power, maybe it's, it's a bad temper, maybe it's, you know, a love for materialism. I don't know what it is, but, but we, we're all fallen creatures. 
And therefore, we're all held by various sins. We're all vulnerable to sin in our life. That sin, if not dealt with in a very radical way, will ultimately destroy us. It will certainly prevent spiritual growth. So sin is a thing we have to deal with. The Lord Jesus um, uh, taught us that we had to be willing to put off the old man. He has to be put off like a garment. It's not a gradual thing. It's a putting off and then a putting on of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there are sins, uh, perhaps unforgiveness. I could go through so many, but there's sins. But then one that uh, the church often doesn't approach, and uh, it's only in recent years that I've come to appreciate and realize just how much this hinders people from spiritual growth, and that is wounds in their lives. Wounds in their lives. Now, often these wounds come in childhood and youth, and these can be very, very, very powerful. And they can be so strong that they prevent spiritual growth when the person later on becomes a Christian. And I have witnessed people who have been so desirous to grow spiritually, and there's been absolute evidence that they are so desirous to go forward with God, and they have been unable to because of wounds. I can think of a young lady that um, had many problems. Her marriage had broken down. A lot of things had happened, and we went along and ministered uh, to this young lady and discovered when we prayed with her, we asked her about her childhood, and she found that a, a good degree of her childhood she couldn't remember, which is usually quite unusual because that's an indicator that something has happened and the, the child is, has, has hidden it. Rather than facing it and keeping it, they just bury it to the back, but it's still there. And often when you can't remember very much, it can be sometimes an indicator that something happened. But what did happen was she had been badly treated uh, sexually by her grandfather. And that eventually came out. And when she was prayed for, it was amazing to see how God came and healed that woman of that thing that happened when she was a child and how that she actually relived the whole event, how that she was um, essentially raped by her grandfather. And the amazing change that it brought subsequent to that, how that, how that she was able to grow spiritually. Now, now, we could have said to that woman, keep dealing with sin, keep dealing with sin, keep dealing with sin, but, but it would never have got her free because there was a wound. And as a result of her being wounded, she didn't know that it was there. First of all, she had, it was hidden to the subconscious. Not only that, she couldn't even uh, really approach or work with other people because her wound, she wounded others. And that's what happens. When you get wounded, what you end up doing is because your wound is not healed, you end up wounding other people. You don't mean to do it, but you do it because of your own wound. And so there is some people who are hindered by sin, then there are some who are hindered by wounds that they have, and then there are others who are hindered by, by demons. They have actually demon spirits with them. And uh, I could spend a long time talking about that, but that's not the message this morning. But there can be spirits that are actually hindering the person going forward. And through sin in their life or something inherited from ancestrally, from, from the family line, there can be a spirit there or spirits. One that's very common is those who have uh, activity or links to, to Freemasonry. Uh, often Freemasonry brings a very strong spirits into the family, and that can be a great hindrance to somebody who comes to the Lord because well, they want to go forward, but they're held back because of the curse of Freemasonry. Now, liberated for growth. The good news is that God, as we seek Him, that whatever is hindering us, God the Holy Spirit will bring it to the surface. God will bring it to the surface if we let him. If we desire him to do that, he will, because the Lord Jesus can heal us. The Lord Jesus can set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that was the purpose of the Lord Jesus on the cross, that he took our wounds, he took our sins, he took uh, our curse so that we could be blessed, he took our hell that we could have heaven. And he, he, he did these things for us in order that we could enjoy the Father, that we could be in fellowship with him and enjoy uh, a relationship with him. 
In the epistle to the Romans that Paul wrote, we have in chapter 11, Paul is coming to the conclusion of a number of great theological truths. He commences with man as a sinner. He goes on to redemption. He continues to the great doctrine of sanctification. And then he comes to the great nation of Israel. And so there are great theological truths all being presented, and, and they're conveying in their totality the greatness of God. And he is bringing before his, his readers in Rome the, just the vastness of God and his purposes in the nation of Israel in redemption. And he brings this across marvelously. And as a result, the Roman Christians were absolutely taken with the majesty of God. They were taken up with the fact that God was God that he was this great eternal being with his hand on this tiny nation called Israel, with his hands on every event that's occurring in history. He always was. He always will be. He is not restricted to time, uh, from the beginning of time to the end of time. He has no restrictions like that. He is the eternal one. He always has been. He always will be. And something of his majesty and his greatness as he sits upon the throne of the universe, as he rules his kingdom, as he rules uh, the universe, his majesty comes across. And not only his, his majesty, but his power and his provision. And so as, as, as Paul is writing and bringing these great truths to the attention of the Romans, uh, the Christians in Rome, he says to them in verse 1 of chapter 12, he said, I beseech you, therefore, in the light of the fact he said that God is who he is, that God is this great being who is nothing but love. He always has been and always will be. If you were to view the greatest angelic beings, whether it were, were, were uh, Gabriel or whether it were Michael, regardless of what great angels or the seraphim that are crying, holy, 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 in the presence of the Lord, none of these would in any way equate to the glory and the majesty and the beauty of God, because these are all created beings. And the amazing thing is, and this helps us to understand just how much sin has corrupted us, that we have an aversion to God. Instead of desiring and really longing for him and to know him, we have an aversion to him. And this is, this is discovered and made plain in the average Christian life. Because if I were to ask you how much time, now I'm not, I don't want to be legalistic. I, I don't want to put you in some kind of bondage as to how long you pray or wait on God. It's not that. But what I want to ask you is how much time can you spend alone with God and enjoy it? How much time can you spend alone in God's presence and enjoy being in God's presence? Because that is really the that's the heart of where we are as Christians. If we can answer that, then we have a good idea as to where we are spiritually. It's not what we do. It's not our activity. So often people say, oh, well, I belong to this church, and I go to the prayer meeting, and I belong to this, and I'm involved in that, and I do outreach here. And, I, and that's all very good. But, but the acid test is how can you spend time alone with God? How long can you be there and enjoy it? And you will discover that there is an aversion. There is something in us. A man used to pray in a prayer meeting many years ago, and he used to say, Lord, there's something in us that wants to get away from God. Something in us that wants to get away from God. And that's true. It's the flesh. It's that old self-life. And that's the great obstacle to going forward spiritually. It's that self-life. As I've said before, if, if you find that the greatest obstacle that you have to your Christian life is some other Christian or some other person, then you haven't matured very much as a Christian. If you can say, well, it's this person that holds me back or it's that person, you haven't matured very much. I want to say without, without hesitation, the greatest obstacle that I have to my spiritual growth is Alan Bartley. He, he is my greatest opponent. He withstands me every step. 
And I have to trust God. I have to lean on the Lord to deal with that person because he will always be wanting his own way. So Paul writes and encourages them because of God's mercies. The mercies of God he draws their attention to. And what he says to them is, he said, I beseech you, because of God's mercies, because of who he is, I beseech you. I I tenderly plead with you. Present your body a living sacrifice. Now, Paul does not come at them and say, listen, you have to do this. You, now, now, you know, to try and use any form of coercion, it doesn't work. You see, you find in 1 Samuel chapter 18, whenever Saul had become an opponent of, of uh, David, you find in those early days that the Bible says that Jonathan's heart, the son of Saul, Jonathan's heart was knit with David. And he loved David as his own soul. And the Bible says that he took off his sword and he gave it to David. He took off his garments and he gave them to David. Symbolic of the fact that Jonathan, who was in line to be the first and the next king of Israel after Saul his father, he gave up the right to be the next king and he gave it to David. And he did it because he loved David. He loved him. He voluntarily gave because he could see that David was the Lord's anointed. He could see that David was a man after God's own heart. He could see that David was the best one to be king and that God had chosen him. And so out of out of nothing but love to David, Jonathan takes all the garments associated with being a king and he hands them all over to David and he never takes them back. And Paul, in like manner, is petitioning the saints at Rome. He said, I'm beseeching you, I'm pleading earnestly with you that you will give yourself to God because of his mercy. Now, he said in verse 1, he says, I beseech you to give your, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice that ye may prove, let me read it properly, to present them a, your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, in some translations, it doesn't mention reasonable service. It mentions reasonable worship. And that's very interesting. You can interchange either word because they're both involved. But the, the interesting term worship brings the thought of, of Paul to the worshipers, to the Christians in Rome, and he said, this is ultimately the act, the supreme act of worship. This is the supreme act. Paul's mind is running right back to the Old Testament. He's thinking about the time whenever in the temple or even in the tabernacle, whenever they were established, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the children of Israel would come to worship God. And when they would come, they would come to just one door. There only was one, speaking of the Lord Jesus, that he is the door, the only way to the Father. And they would seek to come in to the presence of God. And ultimately, they had to go past this first of all, the door, and then there was a large brazen or brass altar. And that altar was not pretty. It was large. It was gruesome. It was covered in blood and body parts, the parts of animals that had been sacrificed and were put on the altar. And when someone was coming into the presence of God, the first thing that they would see would be this great altar. You couldn't get past it. It was just so obvious. And they would see blood and they would see death presented before them. Now, of course, it's a beautiful picture of the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. To get into the presence of the Father, we must must see that he bore our sin in his own body on the cross. And it brings Calvary before us. But more than that, it brings to us 
the truth that Jesus said whenever he, he was relating to the saints. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. In other words, what Jesus was saying was, I had to go through this, and you will have to go through it as well. If you want to get beyond into the Holy of Holies where the Father dwells, he said, you will have to go through the brazen altar in order to get to the Father. And the Lord Jesus invites you and I to come and worship him. And Paul says the supreme act of true worship is yielding my body completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is the supreme act of worship. So if I withhold myself, if I withhold my body, if I withhold my intellect, because when the body is given, all is given. Intellect, gift, strength, all is given. So if I withhold any part, I remove myself from true, essential, godly worship. If you ask the average Christian what worship is, they'll say going to church on Sunday morning. That is not worship. You may worship at church. Many Christians don't worship even at church. You see, worship is the declaration by a creature of the greatness of his creator. Where God is truly known, he is necessarily adored. You see, if I say I'm worshiping God, I'm, in the, I'm absolutely taken with this wonderful being who is greater than all creation, who sits upon a throne and who desires to know me personally and to reveal himself so that I can know him in a very personal and intimate level so that I can abide in him, as Jesus said. If that's available, then it would seem to me, and I'm sure you would agree, it would seem that worship would be being absorbed with him. It would be being absorbed with him. Devotion to God always precedes service to man. And sadly in the church, I think in the West, in, in, in Western Europe certainly, that, that service to God, what I'm doing for God by the average Christian is much more important than me worshiping God. And that's the wrong way around. What God desires is an intimate relationship with you and I, and from that intimacy will flow out a life of service. But it is service to his glory. It has to be in that order, otherwise major problems occur in the church, which are only too evident today in the vast, a vast array of evangelical churches. Paul says, present your body. Give your body, give your intellect, give your emotions, give your skills, give your finances, give everything unreservedly to God. Now, I have on many occasions preached on this, and the reason being because I can see so clearly that it is a vital key in order to liberate Christians to growth. But many, many Christians, and I've, I've been in meetings where, where this has been ministered on, and afterwards the Christians will pray, Lord, help me. And, and they're, maybe, they're maybe saved 30 years. Lord, help me to give myself to you. After 30 years. And the Lord said, this, this is just the beginning. This is introduction to true worship. And after 30 or 40 years, Christians are saying, Lord, help me. <laughs> and they wonder, why is it that Christ is not real to me? Why is it that, that I don't have that longing after God that I should have? 
Why is it that the world has such a pull on me and and a pull for money and materialism and and the things, in many senses, I think no differently to the ungodly. This is their world, and in many cases, it's mine as well. Many people say when you talk like this, they say, this has been terribly radical. This is just basic ABC Christianity. That's all it is. Just basic ABC. Present your bodies in the, in the text in Romans chapter 12. It means a once for all. It means a, a deliberate, willful, desired giving of oneself unreservedly to Jesus Christ, to God the Father, to the Holy Spirit, for him to do with us whatever he chooses in whatever way he wills. In Psalm 118, verse 27, the psalmist says, bind the sacrifice to the altar with cords. The problem with us is that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it was a dead sacrifice. There was no chance of a bullock jumping off the altar. It was dead. But we are living sacrifices, so we have to yield ourselves to the Lord. And then the Scripture says that we are to bind that sacrifice to the altar with cords. Now, what are the cords? Well, I've mentioned one already, and it's the primary cord is love. Duty will not be enough when the day of temptation comes and the world bids you to go and follow it and the world and materialism and so on and so forth and whatever you want to do, that little hellish self inside you will want its own way. That little bit of you inside that is still somehow connected to the devil and to hell, it will still desire to get off the altar. It will want its own way. And so if you are giving yourself to God out of duty, the cord will not hold. If you are holding to the altar to please someone or to look spiritual, the cord will not hold. The only cord that will hold you to the altar is love to God. It is because you have come to appreciate that he is the Lord and that he has redeemed me and he has done great things for me whereof I am glad. And the very least that I can do is give everything I have and am, everything I ever hope to be, it is only the very least that I can do in demonstrating my love to him. Paul says it is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service. In one other translation, it says, when you think what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? You see, the Lord Jesus... He didn't have that sin nature. He didn't have that propensity to get away from God that we have. So whenever we see the Lord Jesus, we discover that that he said as a child, I must be about my father's business. We find him on the mountainsides praying for prolonged periods seeking his father. We find the Lord Jesus always saying and always conveying the truth that he had a desire and a will and a longing only to fellowship with his Father, only to do what his Father wanted him to do. He was always submissive. It's very interesting when we read the Psalms that we discover the Scripture says, A body hast thou prepared for me. You see, the Lord Jesus had a body that was made by the Father. And it was a unique body. It was totally human, but it was unique because 
the body of the Lord Jesus was able to withstand all the fire of God's wrath on the cross against sin and still remain on the cross. A body hast thou prepared for me. And the Lord needed a body. He needed a body. And the Lord God of heaven made you and I a body. We have it here. Here's mine. This is my body. And he said, In like manner as my son came and, and gave his body, gave himself, I gave him that body, and he gave it back to me. And, and I, in like manner, I am calling you to give your body to me. I'm asking you to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm asking you at the end of the day, isn't that what we sing in our courses every Sunday night, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus? But it's not true. It's not true. It's lies. Don't want to be like Jesus. Don't want to be like Jesus because that little hellish self inside that is still attached to the devil and his ways, that little hellish self says, I don't want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like Jesus. Whenever the Lord challenges us as individuals, and it comes as individuals, to present our bodies to him as Jesus gave his body, there are objections that are raised because the devil will see to it and flesh will see to it that there are objections raised to such a calling on our lives. You see, it is acceptable to be forgiven. It is acceptable to be redeemed. It is acceptable to receive the free gift of God, which is eternal life, in essence, which costs us nothing other than to give up our sins when we repent and receive the gift of eternal life. But that is but the beginning of salvation. It is but the foundation stone of the Christian life. And so what happens is when the Lord calls us to follow him and to take up his cross, objections are raised within. These objections do not, do not come in the manner in which I am going to explain them, but in one way or another they manifest in your life. The first one is ignorance. It is ignorance, that is, wherein many Christians will say, well, you know, um, I, 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 I just don't see that. I just don't see that, that I think that's a wee bit too, you know, I mean, it's a wee bit too much. It's like a minister on one occasion was telling me, he said he went to his church and he was preaching. He was preaching about the new birth and one of the elders, well, he wasn't a Christian, and the elder came to him and he said, listen, I'm tired of all this stuff about new birth and new birth. He says, it's got to quit. And the man said, but... But Jesus said, he said, I don't care who said it. And you know, we can be like that as Christians. I don't care who said it. I don't care if Jesus said it or not. There can be ignorance. Where people are often taught, just read your Bible, say your prayers, go to meetings, get involved. That's all you need to do. A thousand times over, no! No! A thousand times over, no. It's one of the reasons why the church is in the terrible paralysis that she's in today. It's why she's as powerless. It's why she's as ineffective. It's why she's as prayerless and as careless as she is. Because this central truth to worship, this central truth to knowing God has been evaded and avoided by the church. Because it's costly. I like to quote what Leonard Ravenhill said. On one occasion, he said, someone said, well, Christianity has been tried and found wanting. He said, no, it has been tried and found difficult and rejected. And that's true. You see, the objections, first of all, is ignorance of God's word, that the truth is here, that the Lord calls us to give ourselves unreservedly to him. The second one is unbelief. This is a very strong one. Unbelief. 
an inability to give ourselves to God because we really don't know if he is who he says he is. Let me paint it like this. If God is who he says he is, if he counts the hairs of our head, if God knows all the details of our lives, our address, everything about us, as his word states, he knows our thoughts are far off, then many Christians will come to a point and say, well, I can't, I can't let go of my finances. I can't let go of my life. I couldn't just recklessly cast myself before God. And the root of the problem is that I don't really believe he is who he says he is. I think that I am feeling safer if I hold to things myself and manage. Now, I'll ask him to bless everything that I'm doing, but don't ask me to be reckless with him. And hence we find that unbelief paralyzes the Christian life. And we have what the book of Hebrew calls an evil heart of unbelief. And what happens is the Christian life becomes mundane. There is no activity spiritually. There is no desire for God in the closet. There is no hunger to win the lost. There is this, like the fish, just swirling around at the bottom, not going entirely with the world out to sea dead, but nevertheless not progressing any way forward spiritually either. This no man's land where multitudes of saints rest. Multitudes rest. You see, accompanying the unbelief is fear. 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 To be so reckless to give myself unreservedly to the Lord involves fear. What might God not do with me? What, what might God might take advantage of me and take something precious away from me? I have come to a place in my life where I ask God to take from me. Even if it hurts me, I say to him, Lord, take it. Sometimes I've had experiences in my life that were very, very painful. And I have learned to get down before God and say, God, I want your will, even if this hurts me, because I know that you won't let anything happen in my life that's not for good. And I believe that, Lord. And so I'm trusting you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to trust in you. Derek Prince, I was listening to him recently he talked about an occasion when him and his wife were in Hawaii. They were meant to be on a, on a holiday. And he said it was one of the greatest spiritual conflicts him and his wife ever went through in an international ministry where God was using him right around the globe. And he said these waves of satanic attack were coming at him and they had been pleading with God and resisting the enemy and doing everything that, that they could in order to avert this battle that was continually coming. And he said it went on and went on. They had no holiday. He said it was just a battlefield. And he said eventually he and his wife lying prostrate on the ground, they, they bowed and they said, Lord, thy will be done. And they said the peace of God flooded their soul. We trust you, Lord. We, we don't know why it's happening, but Lord, we're just bowing to you now. You just have your way. And, and, and the peace of God came like a river flowing over them. My dear friend, if you do not know what it is to give yourself unreservedly to him, if you do not know what it is to walk with him day by day, then you will not know these blessed experiences of the Lord. You will not know these intimate moments where God, the, the, the great creator, comes near. And there you are in pursuit of something that is temporal, something that is, that, is, that is passing, something that is fleeting. And you get a joy from it when all the time you could be in the presence of the creator. You could be fellowshipping with God in private. And know that you're in his presence. And know that he is there. Once you have been in the presence of God, my dear friend, everything else. Do you know what Paul said about everything in this world? He used an amazing word. He said, it's all dung. All that 
beautiful big house and the grandeur and the dress and the fashions. He says, it's dung. The reason why there's objections, ignorance, unbelief, fear, and self-preservation. That little self, that little devil inside. <laughs> I'm not going to die. I'm not giving up. I earned that money. God's not getting anything from me. I'm glad to be going to heaven, but God, I'm not going to let go. And God says, very well, my child. Very well. You continue. But there's a distance between you and I. Oh, yes, I will bless you to the degree that I can, but you cannot come into my presence the way I would like you. You cannot worship the way I would teach you. It can never happen. You will just have to wait till you die. It can never happen to you in life. Because little self is too strong. Very quickly. He said that the body was to be present or to be presented to God, which is our reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. You see, friend, when we give ourselves to God in faith, the Holy Spirit, the blessed Holy Spirit, he comes and starts a miracle in our mind. <laughs> you see, you are only what you think. I am only what I think. What fills your little head and mind is what you are. You're your thoughts. God says, if you learn to worship me as I desire, he said, I will renew your thinking. I will change supernaturally your thought patterns. Paul, writing to the church of Thessalonica, he said, I beseech you, brethren. He says, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, giving our body, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What it means is Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, he says, your spirit, your soul, your spirit's the part that you communicate with God in prayer where you know God. Your soul is your intellect, your emotions, and your will and your body. He says, present them faultless. He says, to give them to God. And God, he says, will sanctify them. He says, God will cleanse them. He says, God will set them aside. He says, he will do it. And there is a metamorphosizing of the mind. There is a changing of the mind. And instead of just going round and round and round, the mind is alerted. The mind is transformed by the divine. The mind is elevated and lifted up into another dimension. The mind is released from the tug of the world and from that insatiable pull of self to get its own way, to live for self, to satisfy self. The mind is released and elevated to a level where you have the mind of Christ where the mind is able to think the thoughts of God, where God has the freedom to impart divine thoughts, and where you find that your mind is being brought into divine purposes, and you're beginning to think God's thoughts. You're beginning to comprehend what God has saved you for. You see, until the life is yielded to God, until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the will of God is always a mysterious thing to you. It is always mysterious. It is always something of uncertainty to you. But when you yield to him and when the Holy Ghost sanctifies the mind and the mind is renewed, then the truth of the will of God for your life starts to come to the fore. 
And as you progress spiritually and grow in God, as you walk with Him, the clarity becomes clearer and clearer, and the daylight starts to dawn, and you discover, this is why He saved me. This is His purpose. This is the reason why he brought me into this world. This is the re reason why he saved me that night or that day, why he brought me into the family. This is the will of God for me. I would be very interested to find out the percentage of Christians that know that they're in God's will, but I would know that it's a very, very small figure. It's a very, very small figure. You see, friends, Paul said, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. Just the other night, as I come to a close, I was in a uh, swimming pool. I'd promised to bring my daughter to the pool, and I went in to a pool in Lisburn. And in Lisburn Pool, there's an area for kind of children and so on, and adults go in with them. And there's this large, like a circle area. And when you're walking toward it, it's just like ordinary water, and you just walk. You just walk in the water. But when you come to the edge where this water is being propelled round and round, suddenly, suddenly, you're almost taken off your feet, and you're just swept. And you just go round and round. And you see swimming with the current. Unbelievable. You just move two strokes and you're halfway around. And my mind immediately as it was occurring, my mind was thinking, this is, this is just like what in, in a spiritual level, what it's like when the Holy Ghost fills a believer. You find that you're walking and it's, you're plodding along in this Christian life and you, you know, you kind of make it, but phew, it's not fantastic. But when you yield yourself to God and God's Spirit fills you, it's like you step into this pool and you find that there's a power that is outside yourself that propels you in a way that you, you just can't explain other than the fact that you have stepped into something that is much greater, stronger, and vital than you and is propelling you in the direction that that water wants to go. That's what it's like when a person's filled with the Holy Spirit. You're propelled in the purposes of God. You're propelled toward His will. Paul said this one thing I do. Let's close. He said, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man to think, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. Not only is there a renewing of the mind, but there's also an expression of humility. You see, with the yielded life, with the renewed mind, with the Holy Spirit giving the ability that's needed to live the Christian life, God imparts the nature of Christ, and there is humility. There's humility. You see, friends, I, I've said this before, but a lot of Christians are lovely to you poke them. <laughs> They're all lovely to you. You just go against them some wee way, and boy, you see, you see something coming out, some some vinegar. <laughs> and you see, that's that wee devilish flesh, that wee self, <laughs> never brought to the cross. And that's why you find Christians like that, you can't work with them. You just can't work with them. Because self is there. And when the Holy Spirit comes to work in an environment where there's flesh, there's a lot of conflict takes place because self doesn't want the Holy Ghost. Flesh doesn't want the Holy Ghost. Doesn't mind a wee bit of sprinkling of, you know, John 3.16 and a wee bit about the new birth, but don't home in on my self-life. Don't talk to me about my private prayer life. Don't talk to me about witnessing for Christ. Don't talk to me about intimacy with God. That is a foreign language to me. Humility. I, I got a little quote last night. I thought it was beautiful. The lowliest Christian is the loveliest Christian. The lowliest Christian is the loveliest Christian. You see, friends, when the Holy Spirit is filling you, you gradually receive 
an accurate estimate of your gift. When your mind renews, what the Holy Ghost does, he brings to your attention. He draws out, and he does it usually quite, quite quickly. Because after all, if we have held out on God for years, there's a lot of catching up to do. So what the Lord does is he starts to bring your gifts to the surface. But because you are yielded to God and open to the Spirit, those gifts are being used only for his glory. See, the problem with the church today is that there are people who have gifts, but they use them for their own glory. Say, I'm doing this for the Lord, but they're packed with self. See them in pulpit, packed with self, loaded with love for self. Look at me. Look how good I am. Got absolutely nothing to do with God. But it all passes for Christianity. The problem with this, and I don't think I need to say this, but, but I'll say it anyway. You find it in every church. But you see the problem whenever you have people who are not on the altar, who have never been filled with God's Spirit and renewed in their mind. Self-life is still there, still quite strong, maybe very strong. And so jealousy and pride and deceit, they're all there. They're all in there. And they're covered over, they're concealed. They just manifest when somebody steps on you. I don't want to be like that, and I trust you don't either. What you want to do is, when you see those things, is get before God and say, God, root this out of me. Root this little bit of hell that is inside me. Root this bit of hell out of me. Because I don't want parts of my life full of bits of hell. Root it out of me. And the problem is, when those things are still there, And the gifts of God that are there are being used for self. Do you know what happens? People get into positions and and whatever in the church, and they become like what, what one preacher said, a dislocated shoulder. You ever see people like that in the church, and they've got a position in the church, and they're like a dislocated shoulder? No matter what way they move, they're they're hurt. And no matter who touches them, they're hurt as well. Because the problem is they've never really found God's gift. They they never discovered what God wanted them. They're doing things that God never wanted them to do. They're in positions God never called them to. And so it doesn't work. It just, it always goes wrong. And that's why God's solution is very simple. The altar, the renewed mind, the fullness of the Spirit, and the humility. And after that, the church works just the way God intended it to. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you long to not only save our souls, but Lord, to bring us into a place where Jesus becomes real to us and where, Lord, we can enjoy real, true freedom and, and, Lord, fellowship with the Father. And, Lord, I pray for all your people here today. I ask, Lord, that you would help each one. That, Lord, you would help us to be open to the Lord. And, Father, where ground has been lost, that we would be willing to do whatever the Lord would ask us in order to advance and grow spiritually. I pray your blessing upon the work, upon, uh, Lord, your servant. I pray, Lord, that blessing might ensue in days to come. And, Father, I pray that you will just work on in all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.